Hello everyone and welcome to the next lecture in this course and this time we have a little aerospace orientation and we're looking at machine vision aerospace applications. So machine vision is a technology which has been increasingly applied to all sorts of applications in aerospace. Uh, examples including aircraft inspection, runway identification, runway clearance, following extreme weather, which we seem to be getting more and more of, and of course many more applications. And uh, the technology that we can employ for this, a lot of the time, can of course involve drones or uh, UAVs. And uh, we can start off with thinking about how we can analyze the airplane condition, and can we detect any dent damage, which is more common than you might expect, of course, because birds can quite frequently collide with uh, aircraft. And EasyJet have just implemented uh, some technology whereby they're, they're using drones to analyze all sorts of tricky parts of the aircraft, like the tail and uh, other parts uh, of the fuselage, to help with their inspection, which is quite a, a lucrative uh, area, because it's quite difficult and lengthy to do it manually, of course, up close. And uh, we can use a UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle, for this with a camera built in, I guess, and uh, of course nowadays you can get pretty good uh, high resolution sort of integrated cameras uh, which will give you some fairly decent images and, and also you can build in lights to give you directional lighting which will help you show up certain dents and defects on the surface of the, of the aircraft. And um, another thing we can do in relation to this of course is get swarms of aircraft to measure and detect various situations within airspace. And as I mentioned here, Oklahoma State University had um, some FAA, Federal Aviation Authority Authorization, fly swarms of up to 20 UAVs within US airspace. Uh, and this is a good one, of course, for, for undertaking identification of debris on runways. Um, I mean, you know, I know that UAVs have been used for a whole range of applications in addition to just uh, airspace ones, of course. And, uh, in addition to just aircraft uh, runways and, and uh, aircraft directly aircraft related applications. Another application that is for UAVs, one possibility is inspecting uh, uh, power cables, uh, very high voltage power cables. Um, but maybe an advantage when looking at a runway compared to looking at power cables is that um, one disadvantage, of course, with the UAV is that they typically have a rather limited, limited range. And if you're looking at a runway, that's not, after all, that, that long. Uh, thing to examine and compared to looking at miles and miles of cable it might be a more suitable application and again if you can use swarms of them you can do each each UAV can inspect part of the runway at a time rather than having to do the whole thing and uh, there's there there was a runway in Florida Tinder's Air Force Base this was damaged because it gets some extreme weather in Florida and uh, Hurricane Michael damaged the runway in October 2018 and uh, they use some robotic equipment to clean up the runway, and you can help direct that by means of uh, data gathered from UAVs, which can all be integrated and help the centralized control of these vehicles to, to help clean up the runway. So there's all sorts of applications. I think the kind of thing that will be happening in the UK more and more as the weather gets more extreme here as well. And of course, it's not just extreme weather we're talking about. It can be uh, debris left on the runway from other aircraft, uh, which is quite a serious problem. Uh, for example, I think the, the FAA specified that you shouldn't put, uh, you shouldn't use titanium for uh, repairs of certain conventional commercial aircraft. But I think that some um, Continental Airlines did so a while ago and left accidentally, it fell off and was left on Charles Gaulle uh, runway in Paris. And I believe that's what caused the blowout of the Concorde, which uh, tragically, so tragically crashed in Paris because of the tire blew out. And then that should normally be not a problem for an aircraft. But uh, in the case of that Concorde, and those before they put in the reinforcement, um, when it's such a high-speed takeoff that part, and, uh, that part of the wheel, a small wheel, that part of the wheel uh, when exploded and that went up and penetrated the fuel tank, which led to that massive fire, which brought the aircraft down. So their solution in that, of course, that was a fault, I suppose, in the design of the aircraft, you have to say. But the solution they had was pretty foolproof as well, which was to put Kevlar linings into the fuel tank, which I think work quite well. So, 
So NASA are also looking at uh, traffic management with the UAVs. Um, and uh, unmanned aerial systems have many applications and uh, you know, goods and services, delivery in urban, difficult terrain in rural areas, imaging and surveillance for agriculture, which I'll talk a bit more about in a bit more detail later on, and utility management, uh, inspecting not just cables, but certain pipelines and other long distance equipment that's a bit remote, you could use, you could use them for that. Now, of course, I guess th this is a great technology and we're talking about all sorts of potentials, but at the moment, um, it's rather limited by the, the, the way that, that we're constrained to fly them. I mean, they have to be flown in the UK within, within line of sight, for example, which is quite a serious limitation. And um, so to, to control them really and effectively on the longer range, especially, you do need a, a, uh, an air traffic management uh, uh, system, a UTM, Unguided Vehicle Air Traffic Management System. So we can safely manage diverse UAS operations in the airspace above buildings, of course, and below crowded uh, and uh, crewed aircraft operations, suburban and urban areas. So, um, yeah, so it's a case of, uh, of trying to control them in this limited airspace, as you can see here, you know, above these buildings but below the aircraft. To do all the useful little tasks that uh, that we can do with them, I think at the moment the technology is a bit like a, a tiger in a cage. You know, there's all sorts of things it can do, but it hasn't broken out too much. Maybe the idea of having to keep it within line of sight is a bit like the idea of someone walking in front of a car waving a lantern, like uh, in the early 1900s. Um, it's really crippling the technology, and it's look at, we're looking for a bit of a breakthrough in, in in the regulation as well as in the actual technology of the UAA. The, um, the U. UAV. So applications, what applications could we have for UAVs? Well, a whole range, a very wide range of applications and all sorts of possibilities for saving money and improving efficiency of operations. Wildfire mapping, I got the first one on the list, uh, such a problem in Australia and of course California. And uh, if you can know what's going on with a UAV, you can <coughs> really help operations, coordinate the operations. So it's not that you would go in and Actually, they, you can't really treat the fire. You can't start, you can't start using um, unmanned aircraft so much for releasing liquids onto the, onto the, onto the um, fires, but you could use it for appraisal of the situation. And different kinds of UAVs for different kinds of appraisal. Going in close and having a look, you probably want you know, your um, the hovering UAV. Um, but if you're going to have a, a wider range look at what's going on down the forest somewhere, you might have a fixed wing, longer range UAV. So different types of UAVs are different types of elements of the response to the disaster. And disaster management is another one I got on there. So that's you know, flooding as well. It could be very relevant to surveying what's going on. Agriculture monitoring is something I want to talk about in a bit more depth later on. There's quite a lot of applications that can be made there, some of which we're looking at. Yeah, law enforcement. Uh, yeah, it's monitoring what's going on. It's probably cheaper to run a UAV than it is... Uh, having a full-scale hel helicopter flying around, uh, just monitoring what's going on. The kind of quality of images you can get for UAVs would be very useful anyway. Telecommunication, you know, weather monitoring, these are all fairly straightforward applications. Aerial imaging and mapping, yes. Um, so looking at real time rather than looking at uh, historical data, the UAV will help you with that. Freight transport, delivery of goods and services, we can talk a little bit more about that. Medical service delivery, I had a student who was looking at delivering in uh, it was actually in Nigeria, some critical medicine, and it seems to be she was getting somewhere with that. Uh, a little bit tricky from the point of view of dealing with the officials and the, and the infrastructure, but the technology seemed to be quite good that she was using. Television news coverage and television altogether is used as you know, UAVs a lot. I, mean, I don't know if you notice this, some very high quality aerial shots that the BBC and others create nowadays are used and created using uh, UAVs with some high quality cameras mounted on there. Oil and gas exploration, you can, you can go over vast distances, especially with fixed wing, and uh, see what's going on there. And UTM, uh, UAV uh, technology management, this is um, one approach to it that's been employed with a number of UAVs and the customers and different aspects of the control uh, procedures here. Um, uh, so I'm not going to ask you to reproduce this in the exam or anything like that, but I thought it's a little bit of interesting background on how... Uh, 
aircraft, you know, UAV traffic management is being configured and organized nowadays by uh, people who are trying to use it for real, real, real applications. 3D maps are kind of interesting down the bottom there. And that's something that we look at in our lab. Of course, we've got this niche of 3D vision, recovering 3D data directly. And that's something you uh, you can incorporate it in a different scale, of course, on a lot on a big scale, on a, on this kind of small scale application. You can you can get the profile of the, of the countryside and uh, incorporate that into your map, and um, that will help you. Put, you combine it maybe with with Google data or something, or data you're gathering, and maybe directed by Google Earth data. Another application, which is quite a nice one, is using drones to inspect uh, exterior buildings, also tall buildings. Apart from the terrifying prospect, it is uh, being wound down on some of these um, some of these platforms. It's uh, it's also quicker and easier and cheaper to use drones for it. Uh, and nowadays, you're getting such good qualities uh, of inspection. The Salesforce Tower in Seattle and San Francisco was uh, inspected in this way. Boston Properties, who own it, said. Um, yeah, we thought the property, the technology was cutting edge. It's much more efficient than having a window washing rig lowered down the building. And the photography is just as good. So that's a pretty, pretty strong endorsement there from people who are actually using it. Now, I think an interesting one, I mean, I live in the middle of Somerset and it's pretty much rural out here. And uh, I'm sure they could deliver to me using a UAV, which would be quite interesting. And... Um, up to 50% of the delivery costs apparently are within the last mile that the delivery man makes. So if you can do that automatically, then you're saving potentially a vast amount of money. And uh, you don't have all the problems of traffic jams and all that kind of thing. And massive sales growth, especially with COVID. I mean, obviously Amazon has seen a massive surge in their, in their demand. And uh, and this is more useful in the countryside and rural application, maybe suburbia, suburbia, not so much town centers, but even so, it's a huge market and a huge potential for UAVs. It's quite an exciting one. Maybe the weight that it could carry is a bit of a limitation at the moment, but still there's a lot of lightweight, high technology equipment you could, in other, in other areas as well, that you could deliver in this way. Because labor costs are quite a large element. So the more you can automate this, uh, the cheaper it's going to get. Yeah, and uh, the tricky bit from the point of view of automation is the final descent, of course. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit complicated and difficult with some applications in some, some areas, depending on how built up, perhaps, how much is going on in the area where you're trying to deliver, how many obstacles there are. But uh, this is where I think deep learning can really offer some exciting potentials because, you know, towns look pretty much similar, really. And if you've got a, a guided as well by GPS, then uh, vision can give you some very useful indicators on that critical final descent, the delivery. You can see what's going on. You can get things delivered uh, more automatically, get a safe and secure delivery, which is so important. And so another thing you can incorporate with that, I guess, is maybe you can have two cameras, two maybe like you know, webcam type cameras, lightweight. And, and then you can start using binocular stereo for measuring range. And I'll talk more about this in another lecture, but you can measure a bit like humans do with two eyes, is that you can get range data. And UAVs might find the combination, I think, this technology, the combination of the range data and the deep learning can give you a very powerful system for implementing and interpreting the environment in the final descent. These technologies are not that expensive. Deep learning, once it's been trained, it can be just implemented quickly and easily. And then the cameras nowadays can be quite lightweight. So this is an exciting opportunity for getting more intelligent AI into the guiding of these UAVs in the final part of the descent, which will really increase the potential application of them. I think some we're going to see more and more of. Uh, of course, there are a few little technological issues that need a bit more work, perhaps. Um, I like it, a long flight capability needed. Uh, the delivery of the medicines in Africa, we were just about finding it wasn't too bad on that, but that's the sort of thing we would need a decent uh, range, really. And, um, of course, you can't just scale up the UAV because all the issues about weight and so on are scaling up as well. So you won't get a much greater range from a larger one than you would from a smaller one, unfortunately. So the technology stands. It's being driven by battery technology, which is, again, also limiting or a factor in uh, smartphones, of course. And uh, the technology is coming along quite nicely nowadays, actually, and we're seeing quite more decent ranges. 
Fail-safe design, well, the design's getting quite good. The reliability of these devices is, uh, depending on how much you pay for them, what goes into making them and how much you pay for them, can be quite good. I mean, my son was bought one as a present recently, just a cheaper one, I suppose, off Amazon. Still pretty impressive quality. It can hover around with a nice quality HD image. You can, you can capture the house and so on. And um, the quality of the manufacturer seems quite nice. I mean, even once it's been once or twice driven into trees, and it's still working perfectly well after that. So fairly robust, as far as we can tell. Collision avoidance, talking about crashing into trees. This is where vision, I mean, at the moment, of course, we're purely manually guiding this thing. But um, it doesn't seem that far-fetched to uh, have a little bit of AI guidance built into there as well. And if, it, if it detects you're coming quick, close up to a tree, it can sort of give you the warnings or maybe even move it away for you. It doesn't seem beyond what you could do with this. When you see this technology, the physical, you know, the physical device itself has come along so quickly. A little bit of software would really, really enhance what you could do with it and really help the ease of use, I think. Uh, so I was talking about um, earlier on, an enabler of uh, direct unmanned UAV, and especially for aerial delivery, is, is a legislation. And the unmanned traffic management we were talking about a minute ago. The regulation seems all a bit non-standard. You know, different countries have different ideas. Britain's got this non line of sight thing, which seems to need to... A lot of technology is coming along quickly, but the, the legislation is not really keeping up with it. It's like, um, for example, in the 3D face recognition, which I was talking about, which we did a lot of work on, the technology has come on very well, especially deep learning, especially with incorporating uh, 3D vision. But nobody really knows how to use it, how, uh, way, well, what kind of approvals you need from the people you will be using it with. Uh, so it's a little bit unclear. That's what's holding companies back at the moment. I think it's the same with unmanned aerial delivery. Different regions, have, you know, different countries certainly have different regulations, even different regions, maybe different states in the United States. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, these are the practical issues that hold things back at the moment. I think, I think uh, more analysis could be done of swarm management and the economics of doing it and also the potential benefits and whether, how that would balance out. At the moment, again, that's not that clear because most people are just doing, just using one UAV for studying at a time. There's some sort of work going on, of course. And the public perception, now there's always this worry about privacy, especially having done all this work on 3D face recognition. I know that a lot of people were concerned about privacy issues, even though the whole idea of, say, the London Underground, and that paper I put on them, on the, onto the blackboard, it's just trying to help people, you know, so they wouldn't have to mess around with bits of paper or swiping cards, remembering pins or whatever they're doing at the moment. Just using the face as a biometric. And it wasn't that you want to start playing Big Brother and start monitoring what people are doing generally. It was just the people who are traveling at any given time to help uh, to make their lives easier, just the people who wanted to do it. But people are always a bit worried about uh, cameras and, um, and monitoring that's going on because but it's really, I think, more of a political and social engineer, social science issue than it is uh, an engineering issue. And... Uh, and again, it's certainly a matter of concern and something you have to be thinking about uh, when implementing UAVs, I guess. Now, UAVs in agri-tech is something which is particularly close to our heart because in the Center for Machine Vision, we've been doing a lot of work on agricultural applications of machine vision over the last 20 years. And um, UAVs, of course, can gather all sorts of information about the status and health of a crop. Um, really, you know, automatically, really. Well, that's theoretically possible. They can assist with planning the daily and monthly activities on the farm. I mean, the UAV flying around is, is a way of getting up-to-date information on what's happening with all the equipment on the farm, as well as the actual crops in the field. And you could deal with the logistics, and you could help, you know, it could help the system say, okay, move this tractor, this, this, this harvester needs moving. You know, it could, the system could be, working out optimal movements of equipment and then directing the farmer as to how to save money and time by doing that. Um, another thing you could do is reconnaissance activities, of course, so you're mapping out the farm. And uh, when you're doing that, you can, uh, you can start communicating with the tools on the ground, directing, as we say, uh, various instruments and equipment to various places. And also um, monitoring maybe what's going on in terms of the crop, because you know, it, for example, we've done a lot of work on weeds in grass. And um, what we're doing, we're working with a, a, co um, a company in Scotland on a farm, and we've built a system which includes a camera and precision spraying equipment, and it's an automatic system which will go across the field and spray some weed killer selectively 
on a weed that it encounters. It uses deep learning to determine the difference between, you know, between the weed and the grass. Um, but um, to direct that, that's a little device that trundles around on the ground. But if you have a UAV flying around above, uh, that's quite imagine you can quite easily imagine that the UAV could direct the little robot with, with a weed killer where to go. You know, the different textures on the on the field recovered with the camera of the UAV can can be you know can be processed and analysed to help you work out where most of the weed generally is in the field. And then, because it's quite effective, we, we went up to the farm in Scotland, they showed us some footage I had from the UAV flying around doing this. And it seemed quite effective, giving you the general area where the weeds are. And then, of course, you send in that precision weeder and it can start doing the detail of exactly where to spray the weed killer. Therefore, you don't have to spray weed killer everywhere. And you're doing a big uh, benefit to the environment and also you save a lot of money from the farmer who doesn't have to keep buying this, this uh, weed killer, which he sprays everywhere. And I don't think it'll be long before they stop this widespread general spray of, of weed killer. Of course, also, when you use general weed killer, you, um, you destroy any broadleaf plants. So any clover which is in the ground will be killed along with the weeds. The weeds like dock are bad for the animals, but clover is good for them. <coughs> and clover is also very good for nutrient in the soil. This is what I've just been talking about. These are images caught by the robotic device, which is just moving along in the field. Now this is fairly obvious for us to see there's a dock there, but the robot could do it as well. The robot uses deep learning by processing the texture to uh, segment the region of interest, which is the weed. The system's called grass vision. Okay. Now this is obviously a weed there, and it's quite clear to us there is a weed, but uh, it gets more tricky even for humans when you're looking at little bits of dock, which is still what you want to get rid of, you know, 5% up to 10% of dock. It's a bit tricky even for a human has to study the image for some time to see if there's any dock there. But we found that we can use deep learning to detect even down to 5% dock presence in, in grass images. So it's quite, it's really suited to this application. It's not going to be long before all the farmers around will be using this kind of technology to selectively spray weeds, at, uh, weed killer at weeds. Really. Yeah, so this is some footage we had showing the, the weeds coming along. I might be able to play it. You see, you, if it does work, you'll see the small amount of dock that we're talking about here. So these are the selective images coming along. We're not talking about any massive plants. Oh, there's a little bit of dock there, a little bit of dock there. We've got to spray a little weed there, rather. Dandelion, we'll spray that. So you look at a fairly subtle, uh, very, this would be very boring and a very difficult task for a human to do over any long periods of time, but we can automate it. So at the moment, you just have a row of, um, just have a row of uh, sprayers on the back of the tractor with a camera, also a camera on for each, one camera for each sprayer, fairly low cost cameras, and then a, a valve on the weed killer and you just spray a, a section when it's detected there's a weed there. In the future, you could have even more complicated systems that uh, maybe use servos to control. You could use also use lasers, I guess, or, or even microwaves to destroy the weed if you wanted to, if you want to completely get away from weed killer. But we even directing the weed killer would be a big you know, step forward. We, we're trying to commercialize this at the moment, and uh, it takes a long time to commercialize it. You have to make it robust and suitable and ready to sale. But um, we're commercializing this with the, with the partner in Scotland. There we go. Tiny bits of weed. Anyway, let's move on to the next slide. So before we realize the significant benefits of UAVs and Agritech, a number of challenges have to be overcome. And we need some key milestones here. Beyond visual line of sight, uh, of course, that's something we need to get beyond if we're going to do something really useful on the farm. Because we're talking about fairly big fields and big areas. We can't keep it all within the line of sight all the time. Uh, beyond the visual line of sight means safe to include public areas of footpaths. If it's uh, if it's going beyond there, then you know who, if something goes wrong, who what's the legal situation? That's another thing that has to be considered. Who's going to take responsibility for accidents that might occur outside the field of view? So at the moment we haven't got too many operators with authority beyond the field view for these various reasons. Um, but the technology is going to mature. We're going to open up the commercial market. The regulations are going to be developed. You know, if a farmer is on the farm and he wants to go beyond the line of sight, he's going to have to get more range. He's going to have to uh, get maps of the area to go with it, and so on. But there's nothing, nothing that can't be done. But at the moment, we need to move beyond. The, you know, we haven't really moved very well beyond, beyond this particular limitation. 
And uh, the UAV is flying overhead, recording loads of data, and often at high resolutions, of course. And now we could be talking about gigabytes of data for one flight. How is this going to be used? And that's a key to the success of everything here, really. Um, we need some good quality, fairly high resolution, but therefore we're going to need lots and lots of data. We're going to use machine learning, probably deep learning, and to implement um, crop analysis and seeing how the crop changes. And this could be very, very useful, of course, because um, you're looking at the crop, you're, um, you're monitoring what's going on with the crop, with the UAV. And it may be that you're using deep, well, you're using deep learning, but there comes a point when you work out, oh, I'm looking at potatoes, you know, these, 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 these plants are wilting a little bit. This is looking right. We're using deep learning. We can analyze it. It's coming up for a crop. We need to crop these up. We need to dig these potatoes up. We'll send the harvest around. So what you need to do then is, um, is get the quality of image data sufficient for that. You need to transmit that data. I mean, you can't really process it on board the UAV, I suppose. Or if you can, you need some very lightweight technology. It's possible, I suppose. Um, but even if you did that, you need to transmit the results to the, to the ground. You're working on different scales. And the UAV, you're working on this scale where you're seeing all sorts of stuff over a big area. And uh, it's a small scale. You're, you're seeing various things in the view, field of view. Uh, you're, the camera is moving all over the place. Six degrees of freedom, you know, it's rotating in your roll, pitch, and uh, moving around. And that's got to be interpreted in terms of the reference frame, coordinate frame on the ground, which requires quite a lot of computational work as well. Uh, so we're looking at different resolution, looking at fields of views that are changing all the time. We've got to relate that. We've got different scales. We've got the scale on flying around in the air, then we've got the scale on the ground. We've had to relate the two so that we can use data from the air to direct the vehicles on the ground. And um, again, that's, that's easier said than done because uh, uh, I know I talked to some companies and I said to them, what about this? You know, we can, we can do this. And they had these websites saying what they can do, these companies who are using, who are trying to develop these technologies. But when you talk to them, they're saying, oh, we found it very difficult and expensive to relate these two coordinate systems. So they haven't really got that sorted out. So uh, before they, you know, that's what's needed that, to sort out those kind of technological issues before we can start reaping the great benefits of being able to control things from the air. Um, you know, but we could direct, you can imagine the potential is great here for this, um, for really directing operations on a farm much more efficiently than you can do just from looking from the ground and, look, and see and identify issues that are going on as well, of course. I mean, uh, it's not just arable either, because um, I don't know if I've, I think you might have seen our How's My Cow system that we developed for a farm here in, Gla in Glast near Glastonbury in Somerset. But this system works very well on analyzing cow condition. But what we need to do in addition to that is monitor the cows on a larger scale to see, look at their behavior, their movement activities, and to see what they're doing and, ha and how they're operating in the field. This could be done with UAVs. But then we need again to relate the data for we're observing two particular cows on the on the actual scale on the ground, and, and link it to the how's my cow system. So there's a little challenge doing that. But it's nothing. It's nothing that can't be overcome. We might need to build in different types of format of camera system systems into a UAV. We might need multispectral cameras. Lidar is not so far fetched as it seems. I guess you guys all know what lidar is. You know, light detection and ranging. It's it's using light instead of radio to map out in 3D everything around you. So you probably use infrared light, infrared illumination. So these systems now are getting lightweight, and they could. There some systems have traditionally lidar has been a heavy heavyweight system, but you can get systems now you could really mount onto UAVs, and that'd be another set of data. Of course, we will get loads of data from that. That might be the kind of data that would be useful, not maybe stereo vision. On different scales, you need different technologies. Uh, but um, when you've got all this data on all these different scales, then you need to relate it all and integrate it, which is, which is one of the bigger challenges. So we've been talking about these quadcopters and similar devices. Um, and they're OK for smaller areas, but um, they don't compare, of course, to fixed wing aircraft when it comes to range, as you've been saying. Um, to cover both the medium and larger farms, a mixture of quadcopters, I think, and uh, fixed wind drones will be essential. So again, you've got two different types of data probably being generated by those two things which you need to bring together. Um, we need to, as it says here, carry a decent payload uh, 
And we need to carry a decent payload at a significant distance generally to uh, to do any kind of the, any of these tasks, especially if we're in any kind of interaction going on, if we're if we're interacting with it, dropping kind of thing off on the environment at any point. There's a company, Quantum Systems, which has managed to combine uh, apparently the effectiveness of vertical flight with a range of fixed wing aircraft. Uh, with a stated range on the Trinity Dome, according to these guys, of around 500 acres, about 500 hectares, sorry. So a thousand acres, not bad really. I mean, that's pretty good because most farms in the UK are not quite at that scale. I mean, in the States, you, you might have those kind of farms a lot, but um, you might be just looking at a couple of hundred acres a lot of the time in the UK. So two or 300 acres, you could easily manage with that. So this combination of fixed wing and the quadcopter can probably bring us most of the functionality we need without any enormous technological breakthrough, revolutionary technological breakthroughs needed, I guess. Now, as I've been saying, the integration of technology is a hurdle that the industry faces in general. Um, UAVs, we want to get the most out of them. We can get the most out of them when we start integrating them at the system level. And that's what really, what this is kind of, the essential thing for nearly all the applications we've done in all the different sectors we've worked in, all the companies we've worked in worldwide in our centre over the last 20 years, it's all been about systems and getting things working in an integrated way. That's the difference between computer vision and machine vision, really, from our point of view. Computer vision can be an academic exercise analysing some images, but machine vision is more like using cameras to get scene data, which is then used to assist in various operations maybe integrating into a factory or in this case into the agricultural situation. So uh, it's, it's a systems approach where we integrate the data and make use of it in practical ways. So it says here there are many startup companies um, in the industry right now and, uh, and they integrate the data and, and as, I mean, as I say they've been, they've been aware of the problems of integrating the data uh, from the UAV with the tools on the ground. And the ability, the success they have in doing that will probably be a key differentiator in the success of these companies moving forward in this, this new technology. Larger firms who manufacture on the, the ground hardware will have a significant lead when it comes to product integration, most likely, uh, and um, because they'll have the resources to implement the integration across lots of different standards and lots of different hardware configurations. You know, they may squeeze out the smaller operations who might not have the capital to to, to cover that big uh, limiting factor. And what you want, of course, is standardization. You know, um, what was it with discs? We used to watch discs, high HD and above. On, on discs we buy, we buy Blu-ray discs. Toshiba had a system out, um, HD system, but they abandoned it and came into Blu-ray because you don't want different companies with different standards for doing basically the similar thing because it confuses the, the, uh, the customer. The customer might think, like in the case of the Blu-ray Toshiba thing, was wait until see which one comes out on top and then we'll buy one, you know, which is no good for people trying to develop and sell these technologies. They need to, they need to get on with it, really. So standardization is something that bigger companies, especially when they group together, stand a better chance of doing the small operators as well. The small operators are just going to keep their heads above water, really, in this, in this field, I guess. But there's big potential benefits, both technologically, environmentally, commercially, and uh, economically, from embracing this technology, you know, moving forward with the future of agri-tech, really. And uh, the way in which we tackle all these issues um, will open the door for UAVs in terms of their mass use beyond the sort of experimental and limited uses we've seen so far. And uh, of course, the outcome of the technological advancements um, that are going to occur like we've just been talking about, integration and standardization, for example, will disrupt the outcomes that will come as a result of all this being applied to UAVs, is it will disrupt the current marketplace as we know it. And I think it needs some disruption, to be honest, um, because, uh, you know, things are, can tend to stagnate a little bit because we have various technologies that people think they are practical for the reasons we've been talking about. We need people to come in. That's why Amazon's doing this kind of thing in delivery, of course. It's really a disruptor, big time. We probably need the same kind of thing in agri-tech and uh, maybe a more conservative kind of industry, but we do need disruptors when we come in, make revolutionary change and demonstrate to the rest of the industry that the benefits you can get through you know, UAV, especially with incorporating vision and deep learning. So the conclusion I got then is an industry that's well worth keeping an eye on. So that's it for this week. Hope you find that uh, interesting. Uh, I'll see you guys again next time around.